There's new concern tonight about China's military capabilities amid a report the country recently tested a nuclear-capable hypersonic missile. This demonstrates a huge step forward in China's military capability, and it's understood that U.S. intelligence had no idea that China had moved this far ahead. The Financial Times first reported in late 2021 that a few months before, on July 27th, the Chinese military launched a rocket that used a fractional orbital bombardment system to propel a nuclear-capable hypersonic glide vehicle which circled the Earth before hitting its target. The news sent shockwaves around the world and felt like the opening bell for a new hypersonic arms race. It also got me wondering, what's this technology all about? And why has it suddenly made an appearance on the global stage? These questions would lead to an obscure corner of the Mojave Desert, where I came across a startup that would teach me a little bit about the nature of innovation and the paradox of progress. Hi, I'm Ray, founder of Credo, and we're here in the middle of the Mojave Desert. Specifically, we're at the Mojave Air and Spaceport. What does this have to do with hypersonic weapons? Well, the subject of the story today is Stratolaunch. They're a startup who's headquartered right over there, and they're building a test bed for hypersonic vehicles. But their journey only recently intersected with hypersonic technology. The tale that comes before is a fascinating story that involves a reclusive billionaire, a legendary aerospace designer and engineer, and the largest plane ever flown. Much of this innovation happened just feet from where I'm sitting right now. This is the story of Stratolaunch. Before there was SpaceX, Blue Origin, and the billionaire space race, there was an ambitious project called Spaceship One, and it would ultimately lead to the first successfully crewed private space flight. In 2004, how many manned space flights? Two. A Russian Soyuz flight in Spaceship One. Tomorrow, we will attempt to add a new page to the aviation history books. If our attempt is successful, Spaceship One's pilot will become the first civilian pilot to ever cross the boundary of space in a completely privately funded vehicle. After nearly three years of construction, Microsoft co-founder Paul Allen and aerospace pioneer Burt Rutan achieved what only three of the most powerful governments in the world had done before them, send a human to space. Spaceship One, a joint venture between Paul Allen and Burt Rutan's scaled composites, would result in the first crewed private spaceflight in 2004 and go on to win the $10 million Ansari X Prize awarded to the first private organization to launch a reusable crewed spacecraft into space twice within two weeks. We're going to do something fantastic. The important thing about today's accomplishment is this is not an end, it's just a very good beginning. The success of Spaceship One showed that a small determined team could accomplish what only the largest nations had done before them. More importantly, they showed that private spaceflight was no longer a fantasy and paved the path for the first wave of commercial space ventures. Projects like the Space Company, a joint venture between Scaled Composites and Richard Branson's Virgin Group, known today as Virgin Galactic. This innovation took place in a small obscure corner of the Mojave Desert. This would also be the eventual birthplace of Stratolaunch. So how did Mojave, specifically Mojave Air and Spaceport, become such a seed for innovation? Well, I think you don't have to look much further than Burt Rutan and Scaled Composites. Bert has a gut feel for things that are beyond anybody on the planet. When you have th things like the feather, that uh, was Bert's innovative approach for reentry that hadn't been tried. You take a supersonic airplane and fold it in half? It's the most dumb thing I've ever heard of in my life. Bert Rutan is a legend, a pioneer of modern aerospace design. He is a larger-than-life character who's synonymous with the innovation happening at the Mojave Air and Spaceport. This corner of the Mojave Desert has been the laboratory for Rutan's creations since the 1970s and home base for his company, Scaled Composites. Established in 1982, Scaled Composites has had its hand in designing some of the most iconic aircrafts in the last quarter of a century. For example, there was the record Reagan Voyager, which in 1986 was the first plane to fly around the world without stopping or refueling. And then there was a Virgin Global Flyer, which set the record for the fastest non-stop, non-refueled flight around the world. And of course, Spaceship One, which achieved the first crewed private space flight. In all, Rutan has come up with 367 individual concepts, of which 45 have flown, each with their own unique design elements and all with a distinct Rutan signature. 
his airplanes and spacecraft take on all types of sleek shapes and sizes, looking more like the work of a sculptor than an engineer, which is why scaled composites became the aviation equivalent of Willy Wonka's chocolate factory. And this is a perfect segue to Stratolaunch, one of the craziest feats of aerospace engineering of all time. According to many accounts, Paul Allen was always a space enthusiast, and given the success that he and Rutan had with Spaceship One, it seemed inevitable that he would pursue another commercial space venture. So when Bert Rutan approached him with the idea of doing something orbital with a scaled up design, Paul Allen was game. On December 13th, 2011, Paul Allen told reporters about a wild project, one he was sold on by none other than Bert Rutan. This project would eventually become Stratolaunch. Rock, the nickname given to the behemoth after the legendary mythical bird, would feature a twin fuselage design and the longest wingspan ever flown. At 385 feet, it surpassed even the Hughes H4 Hercules. And for comparison's sake, the wingspan is longer than a football field, plus the end zones and then some. The twin fuselage catamaran style aircraft would be a flying launch pad. Its purpose, to tow a rocket ship to cruising altitude before dropping it for its fiery ascent into space. The company would be based at the Mojave Air and Spaceport, and construction on a custom-made 100,000 square foot hangar would soon begin. But it would take a little over seven years for Rock to fly for the first time. Sadly, this took place a few months after Paul Allen's death in late 2018. His unfortunate passing would change the arc of Stratolaunch and lead to a radically new direction for Rock. Paul Allen and Burt Rutan's vision for Stratolaunch was for it to be a more affordable and reliable way to launch satellites into orbit. But while Stratolaunch's development dragged on and the company struggled to find a rocket to launch, the private space industry took leaps ahead. Billionaires like Elon Musk subsequently dazzled the world with fiery launches and wild achievements. The industry became increasingly competitive, with numerous companies scheming to lower the cost and increase the reliability of rocket launches. Faced with these realities, and with the change in ownership, Stratolaunch saw an opportunity to use Rock to carry a different type of vehicle. The same awe-inspiring flying beast, but with a different type of mission and a radically new technology in tow. This is where we pick up the topic of hypersonic technology. Since its sale to Cerberus Capital Management, Stratolaunch has had a complete shift in strategy. It now dubs itself a provider of testing and development services for companies looking to develop hypersonic air vehicles. The company is now developing three vehicles to launch from Rock, with Talon A as the initial focus. Talon A is a reusable, unmanned power glider vehicle that uses a liquid fuel rocket motor to help it propel to speeds of at least Mach 6 after launch. It is 28 feet long and has a wingspan of just over 11 feet, and equipped with various modular payload spaces to support a number of key flight test activities. Stratolaunch's goal is for the rock to be able to carry multiple Talon a sized vehicles at once. After completing its mission, it's designed to land on a conventional runway. They're also working on a similar but larger vehicle called Talon Z and a space plane called Black Ice that could be configured to carry cargo and human passengers to orbit. Essentially, Stratolaunch is betting on the idea that we are gearing up for a hypersonic arms race, and there's going to be significant investment into the research and development of these weapon systems. They are positioning their vehicles to enable testing at scale. For example, they recently received a contract from the Missile Defense Agency to supply a target that mimics hypersonic weapons. So essentially Talon A, or derivative thereof, could be used to mimic hypersonic weapons that use unpowered boost glide vehicles, something both China and Russia claim to have. Having the ability to test out hypersonic vehicles in the real world has obvious benefits. Understanding how these vehicles work could help us bolster our own defense systems and could also help us develop our own offensive capabilities. Let's now close the loop and revert back to the original question of the video. Why hypersonic technologies and why now? In aerodynamics, a hypersonic speed is one that exceeds five times the speed of sound or speeds of Mach 5 and above. To give you a sense of perspective, a person traveling at hypersonic speeds could get from Los Angeles to New York in about a half hour. This of course is all theoretical, given the incredibly complex physics involved in transporting a human at such speeds. But weapons, that's something different entirely. Traditional ballistic missiles follow a parabolic trajectory, a predictable arc that goes up and down. It means they can be detected early in flight. 
Hypersonic glide vehicles work differently. They exploit physics using drag and friction so that they can fly in all directions like an aircraft, but at super fast speeds, making them very difficult to detect until it's too late. They fly below the radar horizons, meaning warning times are quite short, and since they're maneuverable, it's difficult to know exactly where they're headed. Given these advantages, hypersonic glide vehicles are commonly depicted as a revolutionary new tool of war faster, less detectable, and harder to intercept than currently deployed long-range ballistic missiles. The major military powers, China, Russia, and the United States, have all bought into this belief, with each investing vast sums in what's culminating in the aforementioned hypersonic arms race. But while commonly touted as an emerging technology, hypersonic weapons were first designed nearly a century ago, in late 1930s Germany. It was there the Austrian engineer, Eugen Sanger and German physicist Irene Brett designed the first hypersonic aircraft, a glider called Silberbügel. It was to be launched from a rocket, fly primarily within the atmosphere, and like all other gliders, stay aloft using aerodynamic lift. But Nazi planners decided it would be too difficult and expensive to build, and so the project was abandoned. But this was only the beginning in the race to develop faster and more powerful vehicles. In subsequent decades, experimental rocket-powered aircraft broke speed record after speed record. In October 1947, the rocket-propelled X-1 became the first piloted aircraft to officially pass Mach 1 and break the sound barrier. For the first time, except in dive, a man has flown an airplane faster than the speed of sound. And in the 1960s, the X-15 reached Mach 6.7 during tests. But the strong G-forces produced by rocket engines placed extreme demands on human physiology. So, piloted rocket-propelled aircraft never became viable outside of experiments. And while research on hypersonic weapons continued throughout the 20th century, no nation deployed them, opting instead for ballistic and cruise missile technologies. But now this is beginning to change. Russia and China now claim to have deployed at least one such system. The US has six known hypersonic programs. Last year, Congress dedicated $3.2 billion to the research and development of hypersonic weapons and defenses. Proponents say these weapons have an edge over ballistic and cruise missile technology, but others believe the advantages are overstated. Whatever the case, the powers that be believe hypersonic weapons present significant challenges for defenders. Which brings us back to ROC and its hypersonic test beds. Being able to test sensors and interceptors against real representative targets will be essential for national defense. I think it's probably logical to conclude that this research could also help us build better weapon systems ourselves. Which brings us full circle in this fascinating and layered story. So in covering the story, I couldn't help but think about the paradox of technology and progress, and also the role that defense plays in being a catalyst for innovation. Stratolaunch is a perfect story to encapsulate those themes. Innovation very often happens in fits and starts. Technological innovation is often catalyzed by governments during times of intense competition. They have the dollars and the reach to gather the brightest minds around a singular mission, and the result is often staggering advancements. But I often find myself thinking, at what cost? This model has brought us destruction on a scale that is still difficult to comprehend. But it's also brought us the radar, the internet, and the jet engine. We can't stop innovation, nor will we cease to weaponize it where it protects our interests. But my hope is that by being exposed to new technologies, we can form a collective idea about how it should be used. And hopefully in this interconnected world, we think more and more about the wider applications and less and less about the defense of our narrow interests. I feel you pulling at my sheet.